Oh, and here they come. The human race. See, the end comes, as it was always going to, down a video phone. Over 2020 and 2021, most of us have spent a lot more time on the internet than in previous years, not just because nearly everyone has a smartphone constantly connected to the net, but because of, well, obvious real-world circumstances that have required us to be socially distant, not just at the supermarket, but at school and work, with much of human interaction moving almost entirely to digital spaces. As such, many people have become seemingly terminally online, relying on the internet for pretty much every aspect of their lives, from ordering food to spending time with friends and loved ones, all seemingly consumed by social media and various other websites. Many have noted that those who are constantly connected seem increasingly angry, callous and vicious towards others. This trend seems to have particularly influenced online leftists, who even other online leftists have noted have become not only terminally online, but pretty vile as a result of it. Like if any of my normie uh, liberal family members saw what's going on on Twitter, they think that we're more unhinged as leftists than they already do. There is a combination of uh, extremely terminally online people, abusers, and kids on the internet uh, on the left that are doing everything in their power to try and limit the amount of people there are on the left and they're just genuinely bad people. Because God, can you imagine all the people who are like maybe kind of on the cusp of being a left-leaning person and then they go online and all the people online they see on the left are like lunatic who are standing North Korea and saying that American socialists should stand with the common cause with the Soviet states or whatever. You're literally- this- this discourse is what Sargon thinks the left is. And people like him. And then it just makes him go, Ah, see, yes, ah. <laughs> what a bunch of- what a bunch of whiny babies. But while the term terminally online has become increasingly common to refer to people who can't or are unable to disconnect, and end up spiraling into intense negativity, the name itself alludes to the idea that this usage is akin to a serious illness. So is it? Do people really need to go touch grass to maintain a healthy life? Or is the term terminally online a misnomer? Since so much of society has needed to move to mediated environments over the last two years, how has that change influenced the mental and physical health of average people? Is being terminally online actually somewhat terminal? Today, let's look at the potentially harmful nature of being terminally online and the benefits of touching grass by looking at social media and internet addiction, as well as the fear of missing out. But first, let me tell you about this video sponsor, a service that might be able to help lend you a hand if you found yourself being a bit distracted by never-ending internet inundation, and that's Sunsama. Sunsama is a cloud-based calendar app designed to help you keep on task with the things that are important in your daily life, be it in your job, self-improvement, projects, schoolwork, you name it, so that you can plan your day and maximize efficiency without getting distracted and bogged down in internet inanity. Create tasks to complete and Sunsama will time your progress so you can more efficiently plan your daily routines. Sunsama integrates with tons of other apps like Google Calendar, Email, Outlook, etc. so you can organize all the events in your life in one simple location. It helps with time management and reducing stress while getting the most out of your time. So whether you're a student or a professional or a business owner, or if you just want to try and organize a regular D&D game but find the process is a bit like herding cats, if you're interested in seizing your day, check out Sensama by clicking the link down below and trying it out for two weeks absolutely free. No credit card needed. Help out the channel and make sure you're not missing out on maximizing your productivity with Sensama. And speaking of missing out, let's begin by looking at the research on one variable that seems to define what afflicts so many of those terminally on the internet, and that's fear of missing out. Fear of missing out, or FOMO, was a concept first identified rather colloquially by users of social media rather than by media psychologists, which is an easy way to let you know that, as a concept, it's kind of insufferable. But regardless, FOMO was described as a seeming need that many people have to consistently check social media sites in order to be kept up to date on the goings-on of the world, be it at large or just within their friend group. Basically, it's the thing that made the games industry an unbearable mess of pre-order bonuses for the last decade or so. Or more recently, it's what made trying to get a Travis Scott burger at McDonald's about as rough as going to a Travis Scott concert, and still makes Total War games nigh unplayable to this day. In other words, FOMO is one of the major drives that causes people to be terminally online. They don't want to miss out. Articles and blog posts regarding the phenomenon began popping up and increasing in frequency in the early 2010s, describing it as a sensation of anxiety that one is being left out or left behind socially, 
and is being excluded from things, be they local events like music festivals or block parties, celebrations or gatherings with friends, or just some popular trend. Mark Moford of SF Gate, not to be confused with his more successful counterpart, Max Mofo, described the sensation thusly. It happens. Texting friends about their weekend plans. It happens. Skimming various tech blogs, tattoo magazines, Facebook event invites, architectural websites, and travel blogs. It happens. At any given summer festival, picnic, concert in the park, it happens when people show me pictures of my book, visiting exotic locales. Hell, it happens walking down the street on my way to teach yoga as I pass by clubs and bars and sundry shops saying, Oh my god, look at that, and that, and that, and I haven't even seen that before, and when did that place get here? Wow, peak journalism. You know Mark Moford is an expert on FOMO because his last name contains an anagram of it. Interesting that the person who seems so afraid of missing out is probably the person most likely to be excluded from social events, considering his apparent personality. FOMO can be broken down into two basic categories. One, an apprehension that others are having rewarding experiences from which the self is absent, and two, a persistent desire to stay connected with people in one's social network, as defined in early research on the subject from Przybylski et al. 2013. These scholars took note of the usage of the term on social media and sought to find a way to measure it and understand the behavioral correlates of this fearful sensation of not being included in some social situation or happening. Thus, to understand FOMO, first social scientists need to find a way of measuring it. In their first study, Przybylski et al. drafted a survey of 32 items designed to reflect fears, worries, and anxieties that people may have in relation to being out of touch with events, experiences, and conversations happening across their various social circles and were able to develop an instrument that seemed to accurately measure high, low, and moderate levels of fear of missing out. While FOMO has mostly been studied in relationship to social media, the scale itself includes more broad questions about what constitutes fear of missing out. So to get a better idea of what constitutes FOMO, let's look at the instrument itself. And if you feel so inclined, you can play along at home and measure your own degree of FOMO by responding to the following questions on a scale from one to five, with one being not at all true of yourself and five being very true of yourself. 1. I fear others are having more rewarding experiences than me. 2. I fear my friends are having more rewarding experiences than me. 3. I get worried when I find out my friends are having fun without me. 4. I get anxious when I don't know what my friends are up to. 5. It is important that I understand my friends' in-jokes. 6. Sometimes I wonder if I spend too much time keeping up with what's going on. 7. It bothers me when I miss an opportunity to meet up with friends. 8. When I have a good time, it's important for me to share the details online. 9. When I miss out on a planned get-together, it bothers me. 10. When I go on vacation, I continue to keep tabs on what my friends are doing. Add up your score, and if your outcome is between 1 and 16, you have low levels of FOMO, 17 through 33, moderate levels, and 34 to 50, high levels of FOMO. Just something to keep in mind as we go forward and examine this phenomenon in more detail. Also, I could explain the specifics of this scale's distribution in terms of both skewness or kurtosis, but not only would that require a bit of time, it's also not particularly interesting to anyone but losers like me who like instrumentation analysis. Heck, in this case, I mean, even I don't like this evil corporate brainwashing variable. So to avoid all that unpleasantness, let's just move on in the knowledge that these guys created a way to reasonably and consistently measure different levels of FOMO across various subjects from a variety of backgrounds and instead look at FOMO in the wild as painful as it may be. In a second study, the researchers asked a different pool of subjects about their experience with FOMO, their engagement with social media, their psychological need for satisfaction, and their extant life satisfaction, as well as their general mood state, and the findings were immediately pretty illuminating. FOMO was negatively related to a need for psychological satisfaction, as well as negatively to general mood states and reported life satisfaction levels. In turn, it was positively related to social media use. Thus, this desire, a need, to engage in social media indicated more usage of social media, but somewhat paradoxically, also that that increased social media use was associated with decreased life satisfaction, mood, and even a need for positive psychological well-being. Yeah, I get it, the ability of these social sciences to quantify the obvious is, as usual, on full display here. But despite how incredibly obvious it seems, you know, we still gotta prove it with data. So, outside of the correlation to social media use, most of the second study was concerned with feelings associated with FOMO, 
And as such, a third study sought to understand if FOMO had any influence on other behaviors online, specifically social media engagement and how individual differences might influence those behaviors. University students were questioned about their experience of FOMO, how frequently they engaged with social media, specifically Facebook, the emotional experiences they had with Facebook, how frequently they used Facebook during the last week, while attending a lecture specifically, and how often over the past three months they had been distracted by their phone while driving, either for text or social media purposes. As expected, those higher in FOMO reported engaging with Facebook more at various times of the day, felt more mixed emotions while using social media, were more likely to report using Facebook during university lectures, and actually admitted to more frequent use of a mobile device while driving. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. It seems then that people who are afraid of missing out on some social situation or event that occurs online don't tend to necessarily feel very good about it, and often end up being distracted, potentially even dangerously so, by a pervasive need to check their Facebook page even while in class or while driving. Given the mixed reports of negative and positive affect of emotions experienced by those who were high in FOMO while using Facebook, scholars immediately focused their attention on how FOMO influences emotions and what might drive people to persistently check social media, even though doing so is clearly not wholly positive and could even present a serious threat to one's well-being, whether it be in something less serious like potentially failing a college class or legitimately deadly. As such, scholars began to turn their attention on negative psychosocial problems like depression, anxiety, and loneliness with FOMO. So let's look at this relationship between fear of missing out and mental health concerns. And although the topic is a bit grim, I would highly suggest not taking a shot every time I say FOMO in this video, because for as depressing as FOMO may be, doing so would be a pretty certain death sentence. Anyway, let's look at fear of missing out, social media, and mental health concerns. To get a better understanding of the potentially negative psychopathological correlates of FOMO, we can look to a number of studies, but let's start with Elhai et al. 2018, who questioned college students about their degree of FOMO, as well as their problematic smartphone use, or PSU, which describes an addiction to smartphones, as well as their levels of anxiety, stress, depression, degrees of general boredom, and tendency to ruminate. Just to be clear, rumination is a tendency to focus on negative emotions. The researchers conceptualized FOMO in relationship to self-determination theory, or SDT, which posits that people have both intrinsic and extrinsic needs that motivate our behavior. As it applies to FOMO, SDT would predict that some people will be driven towards social interactions, new experiences, exploration, and learning, all as a reward in and of themselves, without a need for some financial compensation or avoidance of punishment being sought after extrinsically. Fear of missing out, then, is an intrinsic fear of not having access to something that doesn't really have any particular value outside of the value that we place on it intrinsically. As such, if one's intrinsic needs for connectedness to others and being part of the group are not being met, SDT would predict that FOMO represents a negative sensation experienced when those intrinsic needs are being neglected. And the data from El Hai et al. sample of students reflected that hypothesis. Stick with me here for a minute because I'm about to say some stuff that's going to sound kind of technical and definitely really boring, but it's a bit important as the results here illustrate that people who are depressed or have anxiety are more susceptible to fear of missing out. And when people experience a fear of missing out, they become more anxious and more depressed in a vicious cycle of destructive consumerism. So please be patient for just a moment as we go through the boring weeds of it. Specifically, FOMO was correlated with frequency of smartphone use and use of smartphones for both social purposes and non-social purposes, such as watching television. Although social use of smartphones was positively correlated to FOMO, it was unrelated to all other variables, including the negative psychological correlates of FOMO, while practical, non-social use was positively correlated to all variables. That is, interestingly, using our phones most frequently to communicate with others is related to FOMO, but not the negative psychopathologies that FOMO in turn is related to. Using linear regression to determine which variables predicted FOMO then, the researchers found consistently that anxiety, stress, and rumination remained significant after controlling for all other negative affectivity variables in accounting for variance in FOMO scores. Structural equation modeling allowed these scholars to further determine the order in which variables affect one another and found that participant levels of FOMO predicted depression, anxiety, stress, and rumination and through those negative feelings serving as mediators was related to problematic smartphone use. Stress, rumination, and proneness to boredom all mediated the relationship between FOMO as a predictor and the frequency of smartphone use. 
when using FOMO as a mediator, rather than the predictor-independent variable, fear of missing out mediated the relationship between depression, anxiety, stress, and rumination, as well as proneness to boredom and addiction to smartphones, as well as frequency of smartphone use. Like I said, that was really boring, so let's instead talk about sex. Oh my. No, I, I mean specifically in response to the FOMO questionnaire, with women generally reporting being higher in FOMO than were men. Specifically, women were more concerned with finding out that her friends were having a good time without her, and that she was unaware of what her friends were up to. Further, women were more worried that they spent too much time being preoccupied with what was going on around them, missing out on opportunities to meet up with friends, were more bothered by missing out on a planned gathering or event, and were more likely to keep tabs on friends while on vacation. The researchers also found that FOMO scores were higher in white participants than those of other racial or ethnic backgrounds, and was higher among those in non-cohabitating relationships compared to those in cohabitating relationships. They suggested the latter finding could be because people cohabitating likely receive a good deal of social interaction from their partner that they would otherwise seek from external sources and thus fear missing out on because they already have someone to hang out with. In other words, it seems that dealing with just one person's BS is more than enough. In the full model, there was a direct relationship between FOMO and problematic smartphone use, but this relationship was also mediated through negative psychological affect. As such, FOMO is both produced as a result of things like depression and anxiety, and itself produces depression and anxiety when people feel as if they are missing out on something. While the majority of people use some social networking site, with 2021 Pew data reporting that 69% of US adults use Facebook, for example, don't ask me why, there are differences in usage across demographics. Namely, and unsurprisingly, the youth reported using a far wider variety of these sites and using them at higher frequency than do those over 30. If there are these potentially psychologically harmful outcomes of FOMO as it relates to anxiety and depression, we might assume then that younger people, given they tend to use more social media, might also be uniquely susceptible to the deleterious effects of FOMO. In other words, the Zoomers are probably also doomers and consumers which was studied by Oberst et al. 2016 in a sample of Spanish-speaking social media users from various Latin American countries. Outside of just the negative effects on psychology, the researchers were also interested in how young people might suffer from excessive social media use and fear of missing out. Subjects' psychopathological symptoms, fear of missing out, social network intensity, which concerned how integral using social media was to participants' daily lives, and negative consequences of that use were all measured. Negative consequences of using social media included outcomes such as losing a job, experiencing decreases in grades, having relationship problems, or losing out on some opportunity, be it social, financial, or academic. Those negative consequences were predictably related to both anxiety and depression, as well as to FOMO and the intensity of social networking use. Overall, 60% of variance in negative consequences of using social media, so again, real-world effects like losing a job or tanking a relationship, were accounted for by FOMO, intensity of usage, depression, and anxiety in adolescence, and of all of those variables, FOMO was the most potent via structural equation modeling. So yeah, it seems that fear of missing out and excessive social media use are not only related issues with psychological well-being, but can have real-world negative effects as well that might actually harm one's career or personal life in serious ways. In short, the Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. While it seems that FOMO is related negatively to various aspects of our psychological health, what about physical health? Baker, Krieger, and Leroy, 2016, questioned undergraduate students on their social media use, FOMO, and various mental and physical health outcomes, including mindfulness attention, which refers to awareness of one's surroundings compared to daydreaming or running on automatic. Physical health was measured by questioning subjects about any physical symptoms they had experienced over the last seven days, including headaches, shortness of breath, sore throat, and chest pain. Reports of physical and depressive symptoms were both positively related to FOMO, while only negative physical health issues were reported in positive correlation to social media use. Paying mindful attention to one's surroundings was negatively related to spending time using social media, indicating that people who are more present and mindful of their surroundings are less likely to be concerned with vague happenings that they may be missing out on and spend less time on their phones. Further, standardized estimates model analysis revealed that FOMO accounted for 7% of variance in physical symptoms, 13% of variance in depressive symptoms, and 14% of the variance in mindful awareness experienced and reported by participants. Thus, the researchers proposed a model wherein there is a relationship between FOMO and time spent using social media, and that both variables are related to well-being, seemingly negatively. Being terminally online, then, is perhaps not literally terminal, then, but it doesn't seem particularly good for your health. 
Because FOMO is related to health issues, life disturbances, and psychological problems, it's possible that it's also related to substance abuse issues that so commonly are comorbid with mental and physical or even social well-being, or lack thereof, which was studied by Riordan et al. 2015, who examined the relationship between FOMO, alcohol use, and consequences of that alcohol use in Kiwi college students across two studies. As Australians, we are very impressed when someone is able to drink that much and still get behind the wheel. Geographically close enough, I guess. In their first study, subjects were asked to think about how much alcohol they had consumed in any given week over the past month, while the second study asked subjects to keep a diary over the course of two weeks and make note of their daily alcohol consumption. Both studies asked subjects about their daily social media use, drinking frequency, quantity, drinks consumed per week, and if they had taken any reckless or foolish actions while under the influence of alcohol, and of course, their experience of FOMO, either in the past or during the two weeks of journaling. Both samples were nearly identical in reports of all variables, however, correlations revealed some differences across the two studies. In the first sample, FOMO was only related to reckless or embarrassing behaviors associated with drinking, but not to frequency or quantity of alcohol consumed. In contrast, for those journaling their daily alcohol use, FOMO was positively correlated to both behavioral consequences of that use and the quantity of drinks consumed. Given that both thinking about drinking in the past and journaling one's drinking every day both produced a relationship between FOMO and negative results of that drinking, the researchers also looked at the specific negative results that were associated with fear of missing out and also found some unique differences between the two groups. In both studies, FOMO was positively related to feeling bad about oneself, having less energy, saying embarrassing things, acting impulsively, having a hangover, and memory loss. Only those recalling past instances of drinking reported a relationship between FOMO and relationship issues, either engaging in sexual activity that they later regretted, or reporting interpersonal problems with a romantic partner or family member. Instead, for those tracking their daily drinking, FOMO was related to drinking on nights that they did not intend to drink, missing work or class, needing more alcohol to get drunk, becoming overweight as a result of drinking, getting sick, taking foolish risks, being rude or obnoxious, passing out, and waking up somewhere unexpected. It's reasonable to assume that people are a bit better at recalling the negative effects of drinking when writing about them on a daily basis rather than reminiscing about them from the future. Thus, the second sample may reflect more accurate, immediate negative results of FOMO as it influences drinking behavior. However, reflection also allows subjects to think about things that might not be so readily obvious on the day that they occur, such as regretting a sexual encounter or getting into a conflict with a partner or a family member. In total, then, while FOMO is not directly related to drinking more, fear of missing out on some novel experience is related to engaging in more impulsive behaviors while drinking, some of which could have some pretty negative effects on one's life. Thus, people who fear not being involved in some social situation or event may be more likely to do embarrassing things that they will later regret when under the influence of alcohol, and may just be a little bit more likely to consume more alcohol than those low in FOMO meaning this tendency may not just have physical health ramifications, but social ones as well. My name is Hans. Drinking has ruined my life. I'm 31 years old. Related to physical health issues, albeit perhaps in and of itself in a negative psychological way, in the world of social media, wherein so much of our human interaction occurs through computer screens, how does FOMO relate to a need for physical touch? Are people who fear missing out also fearing missing out on physical contact that they simply can't get through their smartphone or laptop? For answers, we can look to El Hay et al. 2016, who queried subjects on both their general and problematic smartphone use, FOMO, depression, anxiety, emotional regulation, a tendency to suppress one's emotions, engaging in activities designed to mitigate feelings of depression, and the need for touch which is a desire to just physically come into contact with objects, not necessarily people. As we would expect at this point, FOMO was positively related to depression and anxiety while being negatively related to engaging in activities designed to reduce depressive symptoms and positively related to a need for physical contact. Further, need for contact and FOMO were both positively related to reported smartphone addiction, but neither were related to frequency of smartphone use, indicating that people who fear missing out and have a desire for physical touch tend to be addicted to using smartphones, but don't actually necessarily use them more, which may mean that smartphone addiction can act as a kind of coping mechanism for feeling as though one is disconnected both socially and physically from others. Regression analysis revealed that the strongest predictors of smartphone addiction were FOMO, depression, inversely, need for touch, and anxiety. In terms of frequency of smartphone use, the strongest predictors were depression, again inversely, need for touch, and age, inversely. 
meaning predictably younger people use smartphones more often. Finally, behavioral activation, that is involvement with activities for the purpose of pleasure or gratification, and emotional regulation, that is intentionally restraining one's emotions, both mediated the relationship between problematic smartphone use and depression. That is, people who use their phones excessively to the point where it disrupts their daily lives are only more likely to be depressed when the purpose of that use is not for pure enjoyment and when they are less likely to suppress their emotions than others. As such, not all heavy smartphone users are as likely to end up being depressed as a result of that behavior, but those who use phones for purposes beyond more hedonic pleasure and are a little bit less emotionally stable do end up being more negatively affected psychologically by problematic smartphone usage. We don't have to worship a calculator! There is no formula for people! me for being alive! That's the general idea, baby. As such, Wegman et al. 2017 examined online-specific fear of missing out, expectations of internet use, and internet communication disorder, or ICD, which refers to an addictive use of social networking sites and messenger platforms. They proposed a theoretical model wherein state FOMO, that is FOMO at any given point in time and is subject to change, is influenced by trait FOMO, that is FOMO felt all the time, and psychological symptoms including depression and sensitivity to interpersonal communication. State-based FOMO, in turn, they predicted would be related to internet communication disorder and the anxiety which it induces. German and Spanish subjects were questioned about their levels of internet addiction, FOMO both as a state and a trait, psychopathology issues, and internet use expectancies. Internet use expectancies include things like using the internet for pleasure or for the purpose of distraction from daily life. They found that negative psychopathology issues were very weakly associated with FOMO, but were more strongly correlated to intentions to use the internet to avoid unpleasantness in one's life. <laughs> if you thought that was weird, FOMO was also related to intent to use the internet to avoid negativity. Oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> Both FOMO and avoidance intentions were related moderately to internet communication disorder. Altogether, 48.6% of variants in reported internet communication disorder were explained by depression and other psychopathological symptoms when combined with state, but not trait, FOMO, and using the internet for the purpose of avoidance. As such, psychopathological symptoms were unrelated to internet communication disorder directly, but were as mediated through FOMO and avoidance of negativity online. Again, an absurdist joke of an idea. In turn, psychopathological symptoms predicted a tendency to use the internet to escape from real-world issues and mitigate fear of missing out by increased internet use. But at some point, can't heavy internet use produce fatigue? Can't you get tired of it? Well, it sure would seem so. As I, for one, sure am tired of this kind of <laughs> Bro, that's hilarious, dude. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. Since using smartphones only for the purpose of having a good time seems to protect even heavy users from things like depression that might otherwise result from said heavy use, it's possible that using social media for purposes other than having fun contribute more to those negative outcomes, which was examined by Deer et al. 2018, who looked at how feeling fatigued by the amount of information received on social media interacted with both FOMO and mental health outcomes. While so far we've looked mostly at correlational and regression analysis, which while useful, have limitations, specifically an inability to establish a causal relationship, and while regression is used to determine how much one variable predicts another, it can't really tell us how time influences those variables. So Deer et al. conducted their study longitudinally, with two points of data collection over the course of five months, using a sample of the same student body of Indian teenagers. Why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> Subjects compulsive use of Facebook, fear of missing out, anxiety, depression, and fatigue due to being overwhelmed by information on Facebook were all measured. In their first sample, compulsive use of social networking sites was fairly strongly positively correlated to fatigue while FOMO was as well. The strength of this correlation was minimal. Social network use fatigue, which was present in 30.6% of participants, was in turn positively correlated to similar mild degrees to both anxiety and depression present in 5.1 and 6.3 of the sample respectively. Five months later, when the same population was surveyed, FOMO was no longer a significant correlate of fatigue while compulsive use of social networking sites was, namely Facebook. 
In turn, fatigue, which this time was reported by 37.5% of participants, remained correlated to a small and moderate degree to anxiety and depression respectively. Of their second sample, 1.5% reported anxiety and 4.8% reported depression. Across both studies then, while FOMO was not a significant predictor of fatigue, it was positively related to compulsive social network site use, which in turn was consistently robustly correlated to social media fatigue. Results are indicative then that while FOMO is not related directly to fatigue concerning the amount of information received on social networks, it was related indirectly through compulsive use of those social networks. These findings seem to be illustrative then that FOMO is not related to feeling overwhelmed by consuming too much social media information alone, although it can be when it manifests through deleterious degrees of social media obsessive use. The pure amount of data about the lives of others and the events they may be missing out on then are not a direct predictor of those negative psychological outcomes in relationship to individuals high in fear of missing out, which may mean that those high in FOMO are not deterred from a fear of having too much access to too much information to cease their social media use, and thus continue to voraciously seek it out to quell that fear of missing out. These findings may also mean that because those high in FOMO don't really experience social media fatigue, they're unlikely to stop using it even when it disturbs their mood state, even when it causes depression, even when it causes alcoholism, even when it causes headaches and chest pain, even when it causes car crashes. Although to be fair, getting in a serious car crash probably puts a kibosh on that obsessive social media use. Oh no, I think I'm gonna hit that truck. Hashtag, hopefully it isn't full of peanuts. Hashtag, oh no, it was full of peanuts. To better understand the relationship between social media use, well-being, and FOMO, we can look to another study from Roberts and David 2020, who examined the influence of intensity of use and social connections on the potentially negative effects of FOMO. These scholars examined FOMO from the perspective of belongingness theory, which posits that, one, people need to have frequent and reasonably pleasant interactions with several significant others, and two, the interactions between relationship partners must occur in a stable and persistent framework of concern for each other, and proposed that part of the reason for FOMO is a need for that kind of belonging. When people are disconnected, even momentarily, they're not rewarded with a sense of belonging, which could be responsible for the negative outcomes associated with FOMO. In their first study, undergraduate students were surveyed on their levels of FOMO, social media intensity, which includes questions about the integral nature of using social media in one's daily life, and feelings of being socially connected to others. As anticipated, FOMO was related to the intensity of social media use, however, FOMO was negatively related to feelings of connectivity. When FOMO was mediated by intensity of use, it was instead positively related to social connection, indicating that when people are afraid of missing out, they feel more alone, but they can mitigate that feeling by using social media more frequently. Given that these findings may be indicative that social connectivity may mitigate the other negative effects of FOMO, a second study was conducted to assess well-being. Once again, FOMO was related to social media intensity, and similarly, FOMO was negatively related to feelings of being connected, while social media intensity was positively related to connectivity. Social connection was positively related to subjective well-being, while FOMO was negatively related to subjective well-being. But much as with the first study, when FOMO was mediated through intensity of internet use, the relationship to subjective well-being was positive, indicating that while FOMO can be harmful when the one who suffers from it uses the internet a whole lot, then they can tend to be less negatively affected by that need for social inclusion. Thus, although FOMO is generally negatively associated with social connectivity and well-being, it's not always the case, and instead is mediated by a degree of social media use, which can indirectly lead to more favorable outcomes for those who struggle with a fear of missing out. As such, it seems pretty definitive that there are a number of negative outcomes associated with FOMO, be it as a state or a trait. Hell, it's even been correlated with nomophobia, the literal fear of not having access to one's phone. I wish I could tell you more about that study, but it's all in Turkish. Hey, where did all the Armenians go? Don't care. So while I would love to extol the details of Turkish Mirayniki, I can't really explicate beyond the abstract. But speaking of state and trait FOMO, we should better understand who is more susceptible to it, and why some people experience this potentially psychologically and even physically harmful fear more than others. Are all people equally susceptible to FOMO? Clearly it seems no, as men and cohabitating people seem less influenced by the phenomenon. But to get a better idea of personality variables associated with FOMO, Stead and Bibby 2017 examined it in relationship to the Big Five personality traits. Extroversion, emotional stability, agreeableness, 
openness and conscientiousness, which refers to a tendency towards self-discipline, in addition to general problematic internet use, or PIU. FOMO was unrelated to extroversion, agreeableness, and openness, and was negatively associated to emotional stability and conscientiousness. In turn, PIU was negatively related to extroversion, emotional stability, conscientiousness, and agreeableness, but was unrelated to openness. Both FOMO and PIU were negatively related to reported well-being of participants. Participant gender was unrelated to reports of general life satisfaction, meaning ladies are just as miserable as lads, while age was negatively related to subjective well-being, in that older participants were less satisfied with life than were younger participants, but these effects were both fairly nominal. In turn, personality was a far more influential factor as it influenced life satisfaction. Specifically, extroversion, emotional stability, and conscientiousness all predicted higher reported levels of well-being. Agreeableness was also a significant positive predictor of overall life satisfaction. In contrast, openness was a significant negative predictor for both physical and emotional well-being. Much as with openness, FOMO was a significant negative predictor of life well-being, including emotional and relationship well-being. The same pattern was found for PIU in that more problematic internet use predicted lower levels of well-being. Black Belt All 2017 similarly examined personality types and tendency towards FOMO in association with social media addiction and found confluent results. Subjects recruited from Facebook, Reddit, and the researcher's college psychology program were questioned about their degree of FOMO, attachment anxiety in relationships, big five personality traits, addiction to social media, and frequency of social media use. Participant age was negatively related to anxiety, FOMO, social media addiction, and frequency of social media engagement, meaning that younger people were more anxious, more prone to be higher in FOMO, were more likely to be addicted to social media and its use, as we might expect. FOMO was only related to neuroticism, which is a personological tendency to experience anxiety, mood swings, irritability, and sadness, as well as anxiety in general, and a tendency to avoid others in interpersonal relationships, which seems a bit paradoxical, but may be explained by a preoccupation with the broader social scene. Despite the fact that people who fear missing out seemingly want to be involved in social events and interactions then, they also tend to be nervous, anxious, and potentially be prone to actually avoid those interactions. As you would anticipate, FOMO was also positively correlated to addiction to social media and frequency of engagement with it. Addiction to social media was related to neuroticism, relational avoidance, and anxiety in addition to its correlation to FOMO. Using regressions to assess predictive power, social media was predicted by the age of subjects, again indicating that being younger makes one more susceptible to social media use, a radical finding. <laughs> And after adding extroversion and neuroticism into the regression, age remained a significant variable as a predictor in addition to both of those personality traits. In turn, including attachment avoidance and anxiety did not increase the predictive capacity of the model, meaning that FOMO may predict anxiety and attachment avoidance rather than the other way around. Come on, we're gonna switch. You mean like you'd rather do it the other way around? Sure, man. When combined with neuroticism and extroversion, FOMO accounted for 17% of variance in differences in individual social media use. When looking at social media addiction, a similar trend appeared, but this time age was no longer a significant predictor when including neuroticism and extroversion into the model. For predicting addiction, unlike general use of social media, this time anxiety and attachment avoidance were both significant in addition to FOMO. Together, extroversion, attachment anxiety, and FOMO accounted for 30.4% of variance in social media addiction, but FOMO was the only statistically significant variable in the full model. To break this down then, Normal social media use is most well explained by age and neuroticism, extroversion, and FOMO, but not by anxiety and a tendency to avoid attachments to others. But the power of these variables to explain all social media use was fairly minor at just over 17% variance accounted for, which is illustrative that there are a lot of other variables that predict why people use social media in general. However, nearly twice as much variance was explained by these same variables when looking at social media addiction specifically. And of those, only FOMO was significant. As such, while different personality variables and age may explain differences in who tends to use social media, fear of missing out is the strongest predictor of addiction to social networking sites. And to make things worse, is something that seemingly actively is fostered by social media companies. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I and mean, it's, a, it's, a it's a social validation feedback loop. 
If Big Five personality traits alone, then, are less able to predict internet use, and specifically internet addiction, than is FOMO, what other individual differences may explain who is more susceptible to FOMO besides age? Well, one potential answer is narcissism, which was examined in a study from Blanche Neo and Prej Priorka, 2018, in a study of dependency on social media sites, specifically Facebook and its intrusion into users' daily lives. Polish subjects were surveyed on their experiences with feelings of Facebook intrusion, that is, their inability to cease or even decrease their use of the social networking site, their levels of FOMO, narcissism, and life satisfaction. Initially, the researchers included age into the model, which again, we have some good reason to believe might be involved here, but it didn't fit the model analysis, so the variable of age was dropped. Instead, both narcissism and fear of missing out predicted Facebook intrusion in daily life. Narcissism was positively related with satisfaction in life, shockingly, and fear of missing out negatively predicted life satisfaction. Thus, narcissists and those who tend to experience FOMO are both likely to be somewhat addicted to the use of social networking sites, but this addiction influences those people differently, with those who are using because they're fearing missing out generally being less happy with their own lives, narcissist enjoyment of their own lives is actually amplified by obsessive use of social media, perhaps enjoying the likes and hearts and updoots that they receive as a form of bolstering their own narcissistic tendencies, which basically explains influencers. Good morning, Instagram Monday motivation out there. Just because you have dreams doesn't mean you have to sleep on your dreams. Out there are dreams and dreams are reality and we are living in a constant state of reality. So go out there and chase your dreams, but don't chase them too fast because you might fall. But if you fall, get back up. And when you get back, oh, I got somebody in the chat room. How's it going, Mark? Hey. Another trait that may help explain the differences we find in those who experience FOMO could be social comparison. Leon Fassinger devised the concept of social comparison to describe the propensity of humans to evaluate our own behaviors and attitudes against those which we see as socially normative. Because it is evolutionarily beneficial for humans to fit in in whatever tribe we belong to, social comparison theory predicts that people will look to others within our society to gain information about how we should think, feel, and act such that we can remain a socially accepted member of society. That's not the case all the time in all situations, as we obviously often seek to be distinct from others, but there is a latitude of optimal distinctiveness wherein we can fit in with society while still maintaining our own individual differences and agency. Thus, to understand the potential effect of social comparison, we are Tang and Quant 2019 queried German participants on their fear of missing out, a potentially very dangerous question, as the last time the Germans had a fear of missing out, Operation Barbarossa happened, and even more dangerous considering how close in this video's runtime that the German subjects are to the Polish participants in the previous study. Anyway, in addition to FOMO, the researchers also surveyed subjects on their feelings of social comparison, psychosocial well-being, and social media engagement. Once again, age was consistently a significant factor, albeit to a pretty small degree here, being negatively associated with all measures of social comparison, FOMO, and social media engagement. Although being a Zoomer is negatively related to most things. Oh, he alive, punched me in the bad, face! Alive, bad, alive, bad. But in all seriousness, this means that younger people tend to engage in more social comparison, experience more FOMO, and use social media more. All three psychosocial variables, depression, anxiety, and loneliness, were positively related to social comparison, FOMO, and social media engagement. Tendency to engage in social comparison with others was positively associated both with FOMO and the use of social media. As such, people who tend to compare themselves more to others are more likely to fear missing out and potentially attempt to both ameliorate that fear and feed their need for self-comparison by using social media more. And this likely will be more comparison in younger people rather than in older adults. In terms of individual problems concerning psychosocial well-being, depression was directly related, albeit weakly, to social media engagement. But this relationship was slightly more robust when mediated through depression's relationship to social comparison, orientation, and to increased social media use. Anxiety was, similarly to depression, more strongly correlated to engagement as mediated through social comparison, first and then through FOMO. Loneliness, unlike depression and anxiety, was not directly related to social media engagement, but it was mildly correlated to social comparison orientation, which in turn was correlated to FOMO, and FOMO itself in turn related to social media engagement. Therefore, younger people tend to be more prone towards both social comparisons and fearing missing out, as well as having increased social media use. And additionally, all three negative psychosocial variables of depression, anxiety, and loneliness were related to social media use, either directly or both directly and indirectly as mediated through social comparison and fear of missing out. As such, it seems that FOMO is consistently related to making social comparisons to other people, and both FOMO and social comparison tend to be related to psychosocial issues as well as to age. In other words, if you're always comparing yourself to others, you're more likely to be depressed, anxious, and lonely. 
So considering the consistent relationship that we've seen between younger people and FOMO, is it possible that this entire phenomenon, or at least a good portion of it, comes down to just generational differences? Well, that question was posed in a study from Barry and Wong 2020 in an analysis of FOMO across Americans of different ages. American subjects between age 14 and 47 were surveyed on their feelings of FOMO, loneliness, self-esteem, life satisfaction, self-judgments, a measure related to self-esteem, sleep problems, and social media engagement. Overall levels of FOMO were related positively to loneliness and to sleep disturbances, and negatively to self-esteem and self-comparison. This was also the case for FOMO associated with both friends and family members. The number of social media accounts that subjects had were related to overall FOMO, and FOMO associated with both family and friends. The same was the case for both frequency of checking social media and using social media during daily activities. All were positively correlated to all types of FOMO. Similarly, all three types of FOMO were positively related to self-judgment, over-identification with negative feelings, and isolation while being unrelated to self-kindness, mindfulness, and a perception of common human identity with others. Seriously, fear that you are missing out on stuff that other people are doing on the internet is associated with the feeling that others are less human. Well, that doesn't sound familiar at all. <laughs> Truly, a peak Reddit moment. Are we the baddies? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Subjects who engaged in high degrees of social media activity and were low in self-esteem were also highest in reports of FOMO, but those who used less social media and were also lower in self-esteem were also higher in FOMO than those with more self-esteem. While higher levels of self-esteem were related to lower levels of FOMO, those who were more active on social media were always higher in FOMO than those who were less active. Those lower in loneliness were also less likely to experience FOMO regardless of their social media use. But again, those who used social media more tended to be higher in FOMO regardless of their feelings of loneliness. Very active social media users who were also very lonely felt the most FOMO, but FOMO also increased in those who were more lonely yet used social media less frequently. All of these results were present across age groups, indicating that while younger people may be more affected by FOMO in general, it can affect all people across all generational groups. So if everyone of all ages potentially is influenced by FOMO, and thereby susceptible to its potentially negative psychosocial outcomes that we've seen time and time again, what might be unique about adolescents that causes them to be more affected by fear of missing out compared to older adults? Well, Bians, Friesen, and Egermont 2016 examined the fear of missing out and its relationship to social needs, Facebook use, and Facebook-related stress, which might give us a better idea on how FOMO affects young adults. Belgian adolescents, be not afraid, they're just in a study, they can't hurt you, with an average age of 16 answered questions about their need to belong, need for popularity, FOMO, Facebook use, and perceived stress due to Facebook use. 33.7% of adolescents reported a full need to belong, 4.7% reported a full need for popularity, and 8.8% reported a full experience of FOMO, meaning they reported the highest possible outcomes on those instruments. On average, these teens had between 400 and 500 Facebook friends and spent about 1-2 to two hours a day using the social networking site. 9.3% indicated feeling as though they did not belong amongst their peer group on Facebook was moderately to extremely stressful, and nearly 25% indicated that not being popular on Facebook was also extremely stressful. Younger participants were more stressed due to not being popular on Facebook, and were higher in both a need for belonging and a need for popularity, two variables that were both fairly strongly correlated with a fear of missing out. Need to belong, need for popularity, and FOMO were all positively associated with time spent using Facebook. Time spent using Facebook was then related to both stress and not being popular, and stress related to a lack of feeling of belonging on the website. Wow, more and more it seems that the world resembles an increasingly poorly managed Gmod server. Citizens aren't supposed to have guns. Uh, admins aren't supposed to suck dicks. <laughs> anyway, both needing to belong and a need for popularity were directly related to fear of missing out, which mediated the relationship between those needs and Facebook use. FOMO, again influenced by needs for popularity and belonging, was directly related to stress induced by feeling unpopular or as if one did not belong in one's Facebook network. So, it does seem that young people are probably uniquely affected by FOMO, but not all young people all the time, and instead, the effect of age is inveigled by other variables, such as more basic needs for popularity or a sense of belonging. And thus, while adolescents may be a bit more prone to experience FOMO and its negative effects, the phenomenon is not limited to the young, but instead can affect anyone who's just a bit lonely, anxious, depressed, tends to make social comparisons, or is a little bit more narcissistic or neurotic. Although these are all traits that might help predict or understand who is more susceptible to FOMO, 
Fear of missing out can function both as a trait and a state. So under what conditions might all of us be more likely to fear being socially left behind? Well, certainly for most of 2020 and all of 2021, one thing that's caused a lot of us to miss out on many events and social gatherings we perhaps previously took for granted is, of course, the Dutch. There are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. Just kidding. <laughs> Obviously, I mean the coof. With much of the world in lockdown, 2020 and 2021 were peculiar years for social interaction. Lacking the ability to gather with family and friends, much of our interpersonal communication was increasingly digitized and relegated to social networking sites and other online communication platforms like Zoom, Skype, Discord, etc. to greater or lesser success. I'm here live, That's not, I'm not a cat. I can, I can see that. Given the relationship that we know exists between fear of missing out and use of social media, how did the very real inability to participate socially created by the COOF influence the public's degree of FOMO and internet addiction? GOE et al. 2021 sought to examine these issues in a sample of Italian participants between aged 18 and 70. Subjects answered a questionnaire concerning their experiences with FOMO, social media use patterns, attitudes towards online communication, such as feeling able to express oneself more online or keep in more constant contact with friends digitally, feelings of relational closeness with online friends, and problematic social media use. The most common apps used by these subjects were WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram, which before the pandemic, 35% of subjects recalled using for one or two hours daily, and 12% recalled spending four or more hours using those websites. During the pandemic, however, this switched, with only 15.4% reporting using social networking sites for one or two hours daily, and 36% reporting using the sites for four or more hours each day. Fear of missing out was related positively to seeing social media as a method of engaging in self-disclosure and social connection, feelings of relational closeness to friends via social media, and problematic social network site use. That is, the more participants feared missing out, the more hours they spent on social media sites during the pandemic, and the more they experienced problematic social network site use, such as using those sites to regulate their mood states, being preoccupied with thoughts about social media, compulsively checking for updates, and suffering real-world negative effects due to that compulsion. Younger people were more likely to live alone, spend more hours a day on social networking sites, fear missing out, see social media as a method of self-disclosure and social connection, felt closer to people online, and experienced problematic social network site use than did older adults. Parallel mediation analysis revealed that fear of missing out had a significant direct effect on online self-disclosure, online social connection, and relational closeness. Self-disclosure and social connectedness, in turn, had a direct effect on usage of social networking sites, but relational closeness was unrelated. The total model accounted for an impressive 54% of variance in problematic social media use. Thus, it seems that coof error restrictions on interaction increased use of social media, and those who experienced FOMO attempted to mitigate fears related to the pandemic with increased and more problematic use all while improving their own existing attitudes as to the value that social media presents to society, at least for the purposes of self-disclosure and social connection. Not only did people use more social media, they seemingly began to rely on it more and be more in favor of its use when they specifically were afraid of missing out on so many of the things that became restricted or canceled or delayed under COVID lockdowns. In other words, people being sick and miserable and desperate increase in their desire for social connection probably making them use social media sites a lot more, and in doing so, also probably make them a lot more money. Which is perhaps why, in the words of the late, great Trevor Moore, It's time for guillotines. It's time to raise the Since said lockdowns have resulted in people all over the world missing out on a lot of things that they would normally do or want to do, it's probably no surprise that FOMO was a variable of specific interest to scholars since the beginning of the pandemic. And so we can better understand the relationships between FOMO and well-being in the time of the COOF by looking to research from Haryan and Anik 2021, who conducted two studies, one in May and one in December of 2020, to see how FOMO and variables related to it may have changed as the lockdowns continued. As a brief aside, I couldn't help but chuckle to myself a little bit that in the abstract of this article, the researchers referred to December of 2020 as late in the COVID lockdowns. In this study that was submitted in January of 2021, Oh, Haryan and Anik, if only you knew how bad things really were. Anyway, in their first study, again conducted in May, Be friendly, son. I know the world is scary right now, but it's gonna get way worse. 
European university students were questioned on their experience of FOMO as well as their extroversion, curiosity, and productivity orientation to understand if those personality traits had any mitigating effect on FOMO during the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, subjects were asked to report on how much they had kept up with a number of activities during the lockdown, including attending real-time virtual events, watching interviews, sports, newly released movies and series, although why would you want to when you have certified hood classics like this? Stay where you are, fatty. Fatty? Me? You. Fatty! Who are you calling fatty, Moosehead? Engaging in virtual gatherings with family and friends, interacting with social media posts of others, and keeping up on pandemic-related news. How much time spent on social media was also assessed, along with measures of well-being and disturbances in daily life related to potential internet or social media addiction. Finally, subjects are questioned about their information-seeking tendencies, specifically related to COVID and the accuracy of that information. The same survey was given to a similar sample of European college students seven months later in December of 2020, so we can see if these things changed over time. And spoiler, yeah, they did. Early on in the pandemic, both state and trait FOMO were more strongly correlated to engaging in general virtual activities. However, both trait and state FOMO were also more strongly related to attending online concerts, viewing interviews and sports events, and watching new movies or series in December than they were in May. Those who experienced FOMO all of the time, so trait FOMO, were seemingly less likely to engage in virtual gatherings with family and friends as the pandemic progressed, while state FOMO became more related to those activities over time. Both state and trait FOMO increased minorly in their relationship to checking other social media as time went on, but there was significant difference in how those who either have FOMO as a trait or were experiencing FOMO as a state interacted with news about the pandemic. Namely, those with trait FOMO, those who always experience it, basically stopped paying attention to news about COVID by December, while those who felt FOMO as a state, likely because they had been locked indoors for nearly a year at that point, were more likely to report keeping up on news regarding the COVID. In general, both trait FOMO and state FOMO were related to reports of sleep deprivation, having difficulty in fulfilling daily responsibilities, problems concentrating, having difficulty enjoying the moment, and finding relief in the idea that others are also having a hard time keeping up with the constant stream of digital content. Further, both state and trait FOMO are positively related with increased time spent on social media and following pandemic-related news. In terms of seeking out and sharing information, trait FOMO was associated with looking for more information as well as electing to share that information with others online only at time one. In turn, state FOMO was only related to sharing news early in the pandemic, but not later, while it became related to information seeking as the lockdowns continued. Both forms of FOMO were related to increased use of social media in the first stages of the pandemic and became less strongly, albeit still significantly related, to increased social media use over time. The same result was present in relationship to time spent reading news. These results can tell us a few things about how FOMO, both in those who experience it as a personality characteristic and those who felt it specifically under the context of the COVID, have been affected under COVID lockdowns. Specifically, the data are indicative of a kind of vicious cycle, wherein as people engage in more digital activities, they tend to experience higher levels of FOMO, which in turn leads to increased engagement with social media and so on and so forth seemingly forever. This is particularly so for people who experience FOMO as a personality trait rather than as a temporary state, and these disturbances for high FOMO individuals persisted over the course of the pandemic, even by December when many saw vaccines on the horizon. Although, I mean, we all know how swimmingly that's been going in terms of getting back to normalcy. That might indicate, though, that high FOMO individuals have adapted to the new normal by increasing in their persistent, perhaps even compulsive, internet usage. The only major difference over time was information seeking and sharing, which those more prone to FOMO were more likely to engage in early on but seemingly lost interest in over time, concerning themselves with social and entertainment activities to perhaps soothe the feeling that their life was passing them by, rather than irritating that wound by reminding themselves as to why they were missing out. Either that, or they just became desensitized to the topic. More disturbingly, those high in FOMO seemed to actually be more likely to have life disturbances than those lower in it, noting higher degrees of sleep deprivation, difficulty in focusing and enjoying the moment, as well as having lower motivation to fulfill daily activities and responsibilities. And perhaps most worryingly, sense of relief at the thought that others were struggling to keep up with the news, either interpersonal or more generally, just as much if not more than they were indicating that people high in FOMO take solace in the belief that others were suffering under the lockdowns. Considering this is a measure of wanting to be constantly involved in social situations, perhaps that's just a manifestation of misery loving company. It could be worse, at least you're not Anthony Birch. 
In addition to FOMO, another variable that might have influenced how people reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic is propensity for rumination. Rumination describes a tendency to focus on negative feelings and thoughts related to some situation in a passive and repetitive manner instead of attempting to solve the problem or change one's circumstances. Given the nature of rumination, Bayon et al. 2021 sought to investigate the possible relationship between it and FOMO, specifically in the context of COVID-19. Turkish participants were surveyed on their fear of COVID, ruminative thoughts, and fear of missing out. Perhaps unsurprisingly, FOMO was related to both fear of COVID and rumination. Regression analysis revealed that FOMO was predictive of ruminative thoughts, but did not predict fear of COVID-19, while ruminative thoughts did predict fear of the coup. Women tended to be higher in fear of COVID and ruminative thinking, despite, you know, knowing better. The lady has foolishly attempted to join the conversation with a wild and dangerous opinion of her own. What half-baked drivel! But did not differ from men significantly in their levels of FOMO. Outside of gender, marital status also seemed to be an influential variable, as married individuals were more afraid of COVID, but tended to be lower in FOMO and rumination, perhaps because having a significant other provides a bulwark against the fear of missing out on social situations, since even if you're isolating and socially distancing, you don't have to do it at least with that one person, who may be able to give you something more positive to focus on, rather than to ruminate on the negative. Although, of course, that's obviously not the case for all relationships. I can't keep it up much longer! Oh, that's what he said last night, Julie! Oh, shut up, you bastard. I'll have to do what I normally do and finish it off myself! In general, the takeaways from this study are, yes, people high in FOMO are probably uniquely afraid of the coof, and with good reason given that it brought about that feeling of missing out, and also that people who struggle with FOMO may also tend to ruminate more on negative feelings, and thereby probably were predictably doing so when the whole world locked down. Given that FOMO was on the rise during the 2020 and 2021 years, and as such many of the negative outcomes associated with FOMO such as depression and anxiety were also growing in frequency across the population during that time, and although we've talked about the many deleterious effects that are related to FOMO, such as its potential influence on mental health and interpersonal relationships, all things that mostly affect the individual who is suffering from fears of missing out, so often stoked by social media use and certainly not aided by the circumstances of the coup, here's another question. Can FOMO influence behaviors in ways that could potentially hurt others? Well, Tandon et al. 2021 examined at least one pretty creepy possible correlate to FOMO, and that's social media stalking. Now, the social media stalking instrument isn't quite as extreme as that name sounds. Instead, it mostly concerns compulsive checking and monitoring of other people's social media pages. But even by that definition, it's probably not a healthy behavior. In addition to stalking, UK residents were surveyed on their tendency to compare themselves to others online, their level of social media fatigue, social media envy, frequency of posting status updates, and FOMO. FOMO was related to all other variables, social media stalking, fatigue, and online comparison. Similarly, online social comparison was related both to stalking and fatigue, and stalking itself was related to fatigue as well. In the full model, FOMO was directly related to social media fatigue, and indirectly through social comparison, but not through stalking. Women were more likely to experience fatigue than were men, while young people were less likely to be fatigued than older adults. Those low in FOMO and low in social media envy reported engaging in fewer comparisons. A similar pattern emerged for those with moderate levels of envy. Finally, those high in envy always engaged in the most social comparisons, regardless of their levels of FOMO. As such, yes, when people fear missing out, as we have a pretty good reason to believe that they did more than average under the COVID lockdowns, during which time this study was conducted, they tend to engage in more potentially creepy online stalking behaviors towards others, and also be more likely to compare themselves to others. I mean, that basically describes Twitter at any point in time, particularly over the last year now, doesn't it? Moreover, those who experience FOMO at some point tend to burn themselves out and experience fatigue, but not when they are responding to that feeling of missing out by stalking others on the internet. Interestingly then, while FOMO is generally a pretty negative thing that would logically at some point cause a burnout to avoid increasing one's sense that they are missing out on real life, living vicariously through others by creeping on their social media profiles actually appears to mitigate susceptibility to social media fatigue, meaning that many people who experience high levels of FOMO may attempt to ameliorate the negative feelings associated with that, not by disconnecting, but by inundating themselves with the details of the lives of others. Hence, perhaps, why a certain Janny's website has seen so much traffic over the last couple years. How do you sleep at night? On top of a pile of peppers with many beautiful pigeons. Again, given the fact that this study was conducted during the pandemic, the results may be aberrant but they give us a good idea of how a lot of people may have been coping with the events of the last two years. And for those already prone to fear missing out, that seems to be by creeping on their friends online. And speaking of wanting to be informed about others, 
Information, both seeking and sharing it, has been a big concern during COVID, with many people understandably being concerned about making sure they have the most up-to-date data on the situation for their own health. As such, you at all 2020 developed a specific scale to determine if there was a unique type of fear of missing out associated with information about the COOF. The researchers defined COVID information fear of missing out, or CIF, as, quote, a pervasive anxiety caused by the FOMO on any disease-related information and the display of a continuing need to maintain control over that disease-related information. Taiwanese participants were asked about their levels of CIF, calculated by responses to questions about their social media activity, their tendency to seek out information about the COOF, or feelings of anxiety when out of the loop on the most current COOF news. The results illustrate some demographic differences, namely that women were higher in CIF than were men, so basically this. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? As were those with lower levels of education than those who had achieved higher levels of education those who were unmarried or divorced compared to those who were married, and was higher in people who lived in more rural areas and further away from a hospital. There was no relationship between CIF and usage of Facebook or Instagram in general. However, it was positively related to making posts on both of those websites about COVID and reposting messages about COVID on both social media and in instant messages. It seems then that fear of missing out on current information about the COOF is not related to passively browsing social media, but it is related to posting and reposting and messaging others about the COOF, which if the purpose is to actually gain more information about the situation and not just stoke your own fears or essentially gossip about the issue, probably means that a lot of people who are high in FOMO, specifically CIF, aren't likely to end up having the most accurate information, although they sure do like talking about it. Of course, then, the truthfulness of these messages being posted should be of interest considering the ongoing concern with misinformation about the COOF being spread online. As such, Ebardo et al. 2020 examined the relationship between FOMO and sharing misinfo about the COOF on social media, as well as the potential influences of peers and perceptions of risk. Filipino college students were questioned on how influential they felt their peers' behavior and opinions were on their own, how at risk they were of catching the COOF, and their intentions to post misleading or inaccurate information online. They found, yes, peer influence and fear of missing out both positively influenced intentions to share misinformation on social media. This is possibly because FOMO also produces a desire to fit in with peers, so when there's a perception that other people are sharing rumors or speculation about the COOF, people high in FOMO are probably going to try to ameliorate that fear of missing out by getting in on the trend. Considering MacArthur's love affair with the Philippines and the country of origin of the COOF, I guess it's a pretty lucky thing that the only thing the Filipinos were sharing was misinformation, as opposed to sharing… well, something else. So if you're the government, or some hack media organization that wants to demonize people who spread disinfo about the big bad COOF, given the other correlations that we've looked at here, it's probably less likely to be male boomers than it is to be female zoomers and millennials with a smartphone addiction, just statistically speaking. Because age seems to be such a consistent predictor of this effect, perhaps we could look at something else that young people tend to be more preoccupied with than the older generations, in relationship to FOMO at least, and the COOF, and that's Adderall. I mean gaming. Specifically, gaming disorder, also known as video game addiction, which is a problematic or compulsive use of video games. If people are fearing missing out and can't go outside to interact with others, they can still get some form of interpersonal interaction through online games or through simulated interaction in story-driven games and waifu simulators. As we all know, nothing ever fulfilled anyone's need for social interaction quite like an Xbox Live lobby. To understand the potential interaction here, we can look to El Hay et al. 2020, who surveyed Canadian participants in late May of 2020, still fairly early on into that year's lockdowns, regarding their levels of health anxiety, perceived negative consequences of illness, FOMO, smartphone addiction, and gaming disorder. FOMO mediated the relationship between health anxiety and both problematic smartphone use and gaming disorder. Age was negatively associated with every variable, again, meaning that younger people were less likely to experience health anxiety and perceptions of negative consequences of physical illness. In the full model, age was also negatively related to problematic smartphone use, gaming disorder, and FOMO, again, indicating that younger people were more predisposed to those issues. Further, both gaming disorder and problematic smartphone use were independently related to FOMO. Interestingly, while FOMO was related positively and quite robustly to health anxiety, it was not related directly to perceived negative consequences of illness. However, health anxiety was very strongly correlated to perceived consequences of illness, meaning that FOMO serves as a kind of mediator variable here. 
Thus, yes, it seems that people who fear missing out are more likely to have addiction issues concerning both smartphone use and playing video games, and that fear was related to fear of illness. As such, it's very likely that far more people have experienced state FOMO over 2021 and 2020, and as a result, also likely experienced more of the multitude of negative variables that we know are associated with FOMO, from addictive behaviors to psychosocial disturbances to substance abuse and even reckless driving. Well, hashtag stay safe inside alone together, I guess. Also, while there's plenty of things regarding the coof you can't talk about online, I can at least talk about the source of gaming disorder. <laughs> But certainly, not everyone is going to experience more FOMO just because they've been locked down. There are plenty of people who seem to be pretty okay with having an excuse to avoid social functions. So what else may affect the relationship between lockdowns, FOMO, and potential negative outcomes associated with FOMO? Well, Wegman, Brantner, and Brand 2021 suggested that the difference may lie in the strain that COVID has placed on each of our lives including social issues such as being unable to visit with friends or family, work concerns such as loss of work or fear of unemployment, childcare problems such as the closure of schools or playgrounds, travel restrictions, healthcare fears, and in the case of Dr. Brand, a very specific fear of Mr. Natterjack down in the garden. Psst, bloody imagination that boy's got, it's just like his mother. There is a man, Daddy. Little cunt. German subjects were questioned regarding these various stressors experienced under lockdowns, as well as problems with internet addiction, including a loss of control over one's online activities and social problems created by being terminally online, such as feeling defensive regarding the amount of time they spent connected, their need to belong, and FOMO both as a trait and a state. Internet addiction, including feelings of loss of control and defensiveness regarding one's internet use, was positively correlated to a need to belong and both state and trait FOMO, but most strongly to state FOMO. Both state and trait FOMO, as well as need for belonging, were positively related to all but one of the various COVID stressors that participants experienced under the lockdowns, with the exception being health concerns, although health concerns were very weakly positively related to social problems associated with internet addiction. Similarly, all COVID stressors were related positively to the composite internet addiction measurement. Trait FOMO was related directly to both COVID strains and problematic social media use, however, this relationship wasn't particularly robust. Trait FOMO, however, was most strongly correlated to problematic use as mediated through perceived COVID strain and state FOMO. Further, COVID strain was positively correlated with state FOMO as well. That is, while yes, people who are higher in FOMO all of the time are always going to be more likely to struggle with internet addiction issues, FOMO only experienced under certain circumstances that prevent one from engaging socially, you know, like a year plus of lockdowns, is more strongly correlated with internet addiction issues. As such, when people are stressed out by the COOF, they're more likely to become addicted to social media and experience a fear of missing out as a state, and thereby be more predisposed to experience all of the negative correlates that we know are associated with that fear. So given everything we've seen about how people were just more likely to experience FOMO over the last two years, and considering everything that we know about the effects of FOMO, let's come to a few conclusions. Particularly now, when pretty much everyone is connected in some form, be it a simple email address or various social media accounts, particularly after the world shifted significantly towards conducting just about all business, schooling, and social interaction online, a lot of people are perpetually online. And because we're perpetually online, we're constantly exposed to news about what's going on around us or without us. And when we can't engage in those things, well, that can create fear that we're missing out. Interestingly, the more time we spend browsing social media, the more exposure we have to events or trends that we're not involved in, which in turn creates a vicious cycle of increasing our use of social networking sites, producing a fear of missing out, which only produces more use. But being constantly connected, ironically, actually makes a lot of us feel more apart, with fear of missing out being associated with psychopathological issues such as depression, anxiety, and loneliness, despite being a post button away from instant communication with just about anyone on Earth. Beyond the psychological, being terminally online can actually maybe be a little terminal, most likely as the result of being distracted while driving, but it also seems to just kind of be bad for your physiological well-being. Although we have been required to change the way we socialize, work, and learn due to the circumstances of the COVID pandemic, being terminally online and experiencing FOMO as a result are seemingly net negatives for human society, despite all of the conveniences that the internet provides. So yeah. Maybe we do all need to just log off and go outside and touch a little grass every once in a while. 
But hey, what do you guys think? Have you found yourselves feeling anxious or sad when seeing others having fun on social media or engaging in activities that you're not able to participate in? If so, have you noticed an increase in this feeling during the lockdowns? Do you think your mental health has improved or suffered as a result of being constantly connected? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you find yourself getting distracted by social media, consider checking out Sansama to help organize and prioritize your time. I want to give an enormous thank you and shout out to all of my wonderful supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are amazing. You make it possible for me to make these really long videos. And if you want to see your name on the screen here with these fine fellows and lasses, links to support are down below. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volts.